Hi, my name is Jonna and I play football for Chelsea FC and for the Swedish national team. And you are listening to the Blue Day podcast. Hello Chelsea supporters, here at the Blue Day podcast, it is my absolute privilege to welcome this individual on the podcast today. He made 180 appearances for the club, scoring 12 goals. During his time with Chelsea, he was part of the team that won promotion in 1989 and won the full Members' Cup by scoring the winning goal in 1990. Here is Tony Dorigo. Tony, welcome to the Blue Day podcast. How are you? I am very good and thank you very much for having me on, mate. Like I said, absolute pleasure. Are you looking forward to the new season starting very soon? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think with the uh, obviously the Euro 2020s that just happened, obviously in 21, which is all a bit odd. Uh, yes. So that was quite exciting. Uh, but now I have to say, get me back to the league, you know, every single time because uh, the Premier League, it is a great competition and uh, so much to look forward to. And of course, at the start of the season, it's always exciting because with new signings, you know, the new managers, you know, lots goes on. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's good to get it underway. And no doubt at the start of the season, you've got so many teams that think they can do well. Of course, five, six games in, a lot of them know they can't do very well. But, yeah, <laughs> yes. at the moment, uh, yeah, Chelsea <laughs> are certainly right up there. Well, we're going to talk about Chelsea in the present climax later on. But I want to sort of begin this interview, but as I have done with all the others, by asking yourself, when you was a young man, for example, did you have any influences in your life that decided to become a professional footballer? Uh, for me, it was uh, a dream growing up in Australia, in Adelaide, Australia, is really the backwater in, in football terms. So uh, to, to think about playing for the big English clubs was an absolute dream. And, uh, and it was as a seven, eight year old, you know, that's what I dreamt about. But uh, you've got to aim high and why not aim for the, you know, the very top? And, and that's what I did. But I wrote letters. I wrote 12 letters uh, when I was 15 to uh, the top 12 clubs, not the bottom clubs, <laughs> not the second division or whatever it was, only the, the top half of the, the now Premier League. And I got one reply and that was from Aston Villa. And uh, that was it. You know, I had my opportunity. So uh, uh, a lot of people at the time in Adelaide thought I was a bit crazy, you know, come back to reality and this, that and the other. But one or two, uh, certainly mentors, no one would know them here, but, you know, players, hmm. experienced players there said, you know what, Tony, you know, go and, and follow your dream and why not? And uh, yeah, look where it, uh, it it got me, which was a, which is absolutely a, you know, a wonderful career I look back on. But yeah, I think people, if you talk to me, it's uh, 14, 15, you thought I was from out of space. I thought it was a bit mad, but uh, uh, it happened, which is great. And I think when you sort of look at that particular story, the fact that you, you wrote to the football clubs, obviously nowadays it's probably a little bit different because of there's so many departments in these football yeah. clubs now, whereas beforehand it was just send a letter to the football stadium or send it to the the office. But it is just a case of if you are a young aspiring footballer, if you're a young aspiring coach, for, for example, there's no reason why you can't contact the clubs. There's no reason why you can't still you know, if you've got a dream, go out and try and chase it, basically. And yeah. Obviously and that's what you did. And It did. Yeah, absolutely right. And I think what is important as well is, you know, don't let uh, anything get in your way. I, I now do a lot of corporate speaking as well. So I talk about, you know, maximising your own potential uh, and not putting a ceiling in the way of what you think you can achieve. And, and that's really important. You, know, you might not become, you know, you, you like me, when we were seven, eight years old, we, you know, we probably all had a dream. And you might want to be an England international like, you know, I wanted to, but there's nothing wrong with that. We can all have the same dream, but how far we get up that, that ladder, you know, is down to you and, and what you put into it. But also if you do the best with what you've got, you should be really proud of yourself. So it's that sort of attitude I think is really important. And that's why, you know, me thinking what I could do as a young lad in Adelaide, uh, it is possible. Everyone else thought it wasn't possible. Why not? You know, give me a really good reason why not. And there, there isn't one. So in my mind, there wasn't. And you can then go out and there and, and grab what you can. But 
but it's difficult to kind of get in, as you say. But I was lucky uh, in that uh, I wrote uh, <laughs> I wrote a three or four page letter, which was full of rubbish, honestly, and full <laughs> of God knows what. But Villa saw something in it. I thought, you know what, give this cheeky Aussie lad uh, a bit of a go. Uh, but that's what you need to do. You know, just take a shot because you never know what might happen. And who were your idols growing up as a kid? Um, again, it, it wasn't really around English football. Uh, my exposure to English football in Australia was two one-hour football shows. So it was kind of the match of the day, I think, was one. And then Star Soccer, which obviously now no longer kind of exists. And I, I saw the passion. I saw the players. I saw the crowds. And that's what excited me, really. Uh, in Australia at that time, it was all part-time soccer, as they called it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, you couldn't do it professionally. And it wasn't really a, a great career choice, but I knew coming to England, you know, certainly was a career choice. So uh, I did have kind of inspirational people around me, but that was just in local Adelaide football, you know, nothing, nothing like that. My, because my, my first kind of, not idols, but the people I, I looked up to was actually uh, a golfer, Greg Norman. I thought, wow, that, that guy is amazing because he's going around the world. He's, he's six foot three, he's blonde, he's good looking. He collects Ferraris, for God's sake. The guy's a legend, you know. <laughs> And he's an Aussie from Queensland who surfs, no doubt, uh, now makes his own wine. And, you know, what, what, what isn't there to like? But, yeah, for, for me, it was a, certainly a dream. And, and football, the, the level over here was so far away of what uh, I was used to. You've mentioned Aston Villa briefly uh, just a minute ago. 24 years ago, this is going quite a long back, way back now, June 1987, you signed for Chelsea from Aston yes. Villa for a fee when I was doing my research up fee was believed to be £475,000. How did this move come about for you? What an absolute bargain. Uh, yes, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it was interesting because, and I, and I won't uh, quote it any other way, and it was a, a complete shock to me because I went to Aston Villa uh, as a 15-year-old when I had that trial. I then signed as an apprentice. Uh, um, a year and a half later, at 17 and a half, I signed a professional contract. 18, I was in the Aston Villa first team. I think 19 or 20 I was, I was player of the season at Aston Villa. So everything was going, you know, swimmingly well. And I, in my head, naively thought I'm going to be here for the, my whole career. I would sign a 10 year contract because they've been great to me and I just want to stay. Um, lo and behold, one particular season, um, we were struggling at Aston Villa uh, and we could not score goals for Toffee and we were struggling down near the relegation zone. And uh, David Speedy, who was at Chelsea, was on the uh, outside at Chelsea and wanted to move. And Villa was suddenly desperate to get him to score some goals. And when deadly Doug Ellis, the Aston Villa chairman, rang up the equally deadly (laughs) Ken Bates, uh, there was a conversation and Ken said, well, yeah, fine. Uh, You can have Speedy, but as long as we get Dorigo. And so uh, the Aston Villa chairman rang me up and said, right, I'm picking you up in an hour. Let's go. We're meeting with Chelsea. And this is in the March. So the windows were slightly different then. Yes. So this is the, yeah, right at the end of the, uh, the transfer window, uh, the last bit of the season that you could then finally you know, get one or two players in. And so I jumped in the, the chairman's old Bentley and we, uh, we cruised down to the, uh, it was old Post House Hotel at Heathrow. And I'll never, ever forget, we were on the third floor and there was a meeting room on the third floor. But as we got up to the third floor, so I'm with, uh, my agent and uh, Aston Villa chairman, I look across and 20 yards down the uh, the corridor is an agent, David Speedy and Ken Bates. And we looked at each other, so three on three, and then suddenly it was like a hostage situation. We, we kind of passed each other in the corridor. I said to Speedy, good luck. He goes, no, you need you know more luck than me, mate. And we, we kind of passed. <laughs> and then uh, in I went with, uh, with Mr. Ken Bates and had a chat and... Uh, it was all too quick. It was like ridiculous. Mm. So I didn't quite agree to the move. David Speedy didn't agree to the move either. So we went back to our prospective clubs for the March thing. Unfortunately, uh, we struggled and we got relegated. Uh, but Chelsea came straight back in for me uh, with that bid and uh, you know, said, no, we really want to sign you. And um, so I said, yeah, great. You know, off I go. Um, let's have a new adventure. And being at Chelsea, there was obviously times where it wasn't, Basically, Chelsea were not the team that they are now. So you was going to a side that was a lot different. They weren't the real challengers in the league. But what were sort of the reasonings for choosing Chelsea? Was it just a case of the fact that Villa did go down and you want, as you say, you wanted a new challenge? Were there other reasons that played a part in it? 
Uh, when I was, again, I think just six months before that, uh, Liverpool had, a, I think, put a bid in as well. I think Manchester United put a bid in, uh, but Chelsea's bid was like way over uh, right. kind of anyone else's. Um, mm-hmm. But also I think as a player, what is important is you want to feel wanted. You know, you, you really want to feel wanted. And it was just a shock to me that Villa even thought of kind of, you know, uh, selling me to, and I understand yeah. why they did it, you know, but that changed my mindset completely. I thought, hold a sec. You know, I need to go somewhere where they really do want me. Uh, at the same time, I wanted to play uh, as the Premier League is now, you know, in the, in the top division. Yeah. Uh, and, and Chelsea had some really good players. Uh, it was, a, you know, obviously Chelsea is an attractive proposition even back then, you know, obviously West London and all that goes with it. Uh, so I thought, yeah, yeah. And John Hollands met with uh, John Hollands and who was just fantastic. You know, what a guy he was. And I thought, yeah, let, let, let's, uh, let's give this a go. I'm going to, you know, have some fun down here. You've mentioned John Hollins. What was he like as a coach for you? Uh, really good. Really, really good. He was uh, firstly a, a lovely human being. That's the, that's the first thing I'll say. You know, what a guy. And then uh, he's enthusiastic, you know, good coach. Obviously had a, a coaching team around him as well. Uh, but yeah, I got on, you know, really well with him. Um, and he was, a, you know, an excellent manager. The only thing I would say is that he was always uh, hamstrung to a point. Because, uh, as yes, he was the manager in name, but certainly Mr. Bates had his fingers in everything, you know, uh, all the pies at that point. And, and that's what I soon found um, was a, a problem, you know, in, in that if you really, really want to win things, you know, everyone has to be rowing in the right direction. And uh, I just that, that's when I started finding out uh, it's, there's some difficult things, you know, at, uh, at the club. But uh, Holly for me was great. You know, and that one of the reasons I came because uh, such a good guy and such a good coach. Do you remember your first day of training? What was that like being with your new teammates and sort of joining a new club? Um, I don't remember the, the exact first day, but I do remember, you know, the, the, the first, the start of it type of thing. Cause you had, uh, I suppose one or two kind of left backs that were there that, that kind of knew they weren't going to play and that, that I was going to play. And that was a bit, you know, Keith Dublin, I think Dubbers was there kind of at that point as well. And it, it, that's always a bit awkward when you know that, uh, you know, someone has come in to take your place type of thing. So, uh, mm. but, but on the whole, the, the lads were great. You know, they were really were a good bunch of lads and, um, you know, and some fine players. And that's the thing. And when you look at it closely, we had some, you know, some really good players there. Uh, and I remember, you know, so many battle with good old Pat Nevin in training. Uh, <laughs> we used to like kick lumps out of each other and he'd try and take me and I'd kick him again. And, you know, and on we went. So, but all in very good nature, obviously. And uh, yeah, I thought, yeah, you know, we had some really good players. You know, I, th- and I thought, I honestly thought, you know, we could do, we could do well. Now you made your debut for Chelsea. It was against Sheffield Wednesday. Do you remember it well? And what was the atmosphere like on opening day? The weirdest thing I think I remember about the Sheffield Wednesday game uh, was actually <laughs> the, what the chairman did before the game. Uh, okay. trying to get us to sign a document uh, with regard to deduction of tax. And this is what I'm on about, in that Holly had worked so hard in pre-season to get us all ready and tuned in. Mm. And suddenly there'd be a grenade, you know, inside the dressing room. And, uh, you know, we suddenly didn't come out for our warm-up on time because we were still complaining that we're not signing these documents. It was stuff like mm. that that I found quite shocking. Uh, yeah, if you put that aside and suddenly you get out and with the boys and the team, it was it was wonderful. So yeah, once we uh, got out of that, we didn't sign obviously anything. Uh, told them where to go, got our kit back on, <laughs> ran outside, and then it was nuts. You know, then you see the crowd are going absolutely crazy, uh, and off you go. And uh, yeah, the bridge. I know it was a bit different to what it is now, mm. but uh, you know, there's some real hardcore fans at, at Chelsea, and, and you know that at home and especially away as well. You know, the support, the travelling support. I always gauge a club by, you know, how many can you can you take up to wherever it is on a cold Tuesday night? And uh, Chelsea always took, you know, thousands upon thousands. And uh, yeah, the, the support was always brilliant. The season that you did join, 87-88, Chelsea were relegated at the end of that season. Yeah. In, back in September, we were second in the league. So in your opinion, based on that, what what happened? What transpired from being where we were sort of at round about the start of the season, sort of go heading into like the first 10 games, to then being relegated, having that playoff with Middlesbrough. Middlesbrough. It was a yeah. two-legged playoff. What, in your opinion, caused the club to go yeah. down to uh, the second division? I think... Um... 
I don't know how, to be honest, I still don't quite know how we did go down because with the players that we had, you know, we, we should never have, uh, have gone down. Uh, but once you get on that slippery slope, you start making mistakes, you know, and again, uh, and, you know, we, I take responsibility equally as, as every, all the other players do for, you know, the performances that season. But there were still other things around the place that just weren't helping. So you put it all together and suddenly you're not performing where you should be. And then you get on a bit of a slippery slope. And I think it was the only season, I think I'm right in saying the only season that the fourth bottom side uh, ended up going down because it was a playoff, you know, against Middlesbrough. And so we had, obviously we ended up going down. I remember uh, in the second leg, I think Pat Nevin had a chance to to score near the end of the game to, you know, get us back, back in it and mm. somehow missed as well. Just whatever we did just, you know, didn't work out. So it was like it was destined to say, no, no, you've got to get relegated. You've got to experience that and then, you know, get back up again. So, Hugely frustrating. You go to a new club and uh, you want to perform well. And I think uh, I did well. It was good. But as a team, you know, we, we didn't do well and it, it wasn't uh, it wasn't good enough. But the weirdest memory I have of that, when we actually did get relegated from the end of that Middlesbrough game, as soon as the game had finished, I walked into the dressing room um, and obviously we were desolate. You know, we were so disappointed. No one really said much at all. And then the, uh, you know, the manager came out um, expressed, you know, his uh, disappointment, but, you know, thanked everyone and this, that and the other. Oh, and also, uh, Tony, you've made the England squad for the 1988 European Championships. You're, you're off to Germany, you know, with the England squad uh, in a few weeks. And I thought, what the hell is going on? Like, what, what, a, be t- what a time to be told just after yeah. being relegated. You know, it, yeah. was, uh, it was all a bit weird, I have to say. But uh, yeah, hugely disappointing, obviously, but uh, you've got to get on with it and uh, roll your sleeves up and, and crack on. You talk about the dressing room at Chelsea. Now, I've spoken to a few people that were at part of that side. And was there sort of a, a collective from you to say, was there any clicks that you found within the Chelsea team when we was going through a bit of a, pa- a bad patch and there were certain people that weren't happy with others? Did you see that at all or was it? I think when you look at, um, and again, I, I talk a lot about this, and I use mm. Chelsea as an example and Villa and what have you. When you when you have issues, when things don't go well, that's what people do. They go insular, they go to clicks, they start blaming others, and you know mm. you need to take responsibility. You know that sort of thing is the sign of a a weakened group. And so you're right, you know naturally that that does happen, but. There, there were quite good reasons why that could happen as well from outside of our, our team. And that was the frustrating thing that, you know, we were struggling as it was. We didn't need, you know, more problems to try and kind of sort out. Uh, so, yeah, and, and you had, um, yeah, well, just some people that lived like in, in Hemel Hempstead, so North London. Others lived in Surrey and Camberley down there. So, you know, they'd all go together and we'd all go together. It was just kind of where everyone lived as well. But you know what, none of that is an issue when things are, are going well, but it suddenly becomes a, you know, more and more of a, a, a problem, uh, you know, when things don't go well. So you're always going to get some unhappy people that aren't playing or whatever it is. That's just the nature of the sport. But what I will say is, you know, once the following season come round and we were winning the league by 10, 15 points and beating everyone in sight, well, lo and behold, all those problems disappear. You know, it doesn't matter where you are or what you do. So it, it really is a sign really of, uh, you know, of where you are and some, and some people, you know, handled it not as well as others. For you personally, though, you did, however, win Chelsea's Player of the Year at that season. This must have pleased you and it also gave you the confidence boost knowing that you, despite the team being relegated, that your performances were that consistent enough for fans to support you and also the players to see what you was doing on, on the pitch. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, and, and I must admit, I, uh, I'm very proud of of that as well. Um, for a fullback, you know, sometimes we don't always get the the limelight. It's those pesky strikers that keep scoring the goals and what have you. But you know what? Uh, I think uh, you know, true football fans they just love a player that you know gives a hundred percent for their team. You know, whatever that is, and uh, I think that's all I do. I just go out there and, and give my best, and I do what I can do. And um, yeah, I, I, and that's one thing I'm very proud of. I was Player of the Year at Aston Villa for one of the years at Chelsea. Then at Leeds United, when we won the title, I went to mm-hmm. Torino as Player of the Year there as well. So those awards, uh, yeah, for me, they, they they mean a lot. Yeah, absolutely. And just to know that the you know the, the Chelsea fans are behind you is uh, is great. You've mentioned 
1988 European Championships, you get called up. And as you say, the timing could have been a bit better, you know, massively. But <laughs> there was a little bit of rumours that when I was going through, there was a little bit of rumours that came out, um, whether it actually came out in, in one of the newspapers, that was it true that you did ask for a transfer that summer when Chelsea got relegated and whether or not that coincided with being called up to England? Was there any truth to the rumours in no, that? No, well, it was a bit it was a bit later than that. Uh, right. And uh, it was... Um, so we... So Glasgow Rangers were uh, in for me and they were trying to, to, to buy me. And I think we were trying to get, I think, little Derek Ferguson for Chelsea. So it was going to be like a swap deal type of thing. Hmm. Uh, and uh, they were trying and trying for, for quite a long time. And... It was just, uh, it was hugely frustrating but, you know, at Chelsea, as I said, you know, and it wasn't within the camp, it was outside. And I just found it when you, and Aston Villa, again, everyone was going the right direction, the same direction. It may not have been very good that last season, but at least from the chairman to the, the coaches, everyone had the same ideas. Where at that time at Chelsea, it's very different to what it is now. And that's what I suppose maybe some people listening to this will find it hard to, to understand. But um you know, the, the, the owner can have a huge influence on things and how things are run and, and what, what, what's done. And um, it, it was a struggle. So Holly, I think, you know, eventually he, had, he left and uh, suddenly, you know, we had new managers here and everywhere. And then I had Glasgow Rangers, you know, desperate to get me up to there. And that was when they had all the England internationals up there. So, you know, Chris Wood, Terry Butcher, you know, Gary Stevens, Trevor Steven, uh, all of that lot. So um, I went in to see the chairman and, uh, yep, I did put a transfer request in. I explained exactly why. Uh, so I went into great detail. I was rather nervous <laughs> going in there and telling him, <laughs> as you could imagine. But to be fair to him, he sat there and listened. Um, but then when he did listen, he said, I'll just get your contract. He turned it over and says, you've still got two years left. There's the door. I won't talk. I won't mention the expletives that he then used. So sure. uh, I thought you're never going to be a politician, Mr. Bates. Um, <laughs> but you know, I will, I will hang around. I'll do my best. Uh, and then I'll look to you know, to, to see where else uh, I could go that um, I think gives me a better opportunity to, to win the win titles and win, mm-hmm. win medals. Uh, and that's, that's the top and bottom of it. You know, um, I, he said no, and that's it. So I, I played out to right to the end of my career and, uh, you know, really enjoyed it. We did well. We, we come back up and won by a mile. Then I think we mm-hmm. finished on seventh or eighth or something or other, but, you know, we were never far from a bit of a catastrophe or a disaster. And, and there was like this bit of a roller coaster at the time, which, uh, I thought there's got to be better circumstances to, you know, to try and, uh, and, and win stuff. But yeah, certainly that, that even the, the season, the championship were, you know, was fantastic. I mean, wow. It was, uh, it was some season. We, I think we went 35 or 36 games unbeaten at one point. Mm-hmm. And then we went up to Man City and uh, that game will, that will live long in the memory because it was us and Man City basically, you know, for the title uh, to be champions. And uh, yeah, that away game was, was brilliant. I'll talk about the Man City game just a bit but I just want to sort of go back to with Chelsea being relegated but that yeah. summer with Bobby Campbell at the helm and he brought in the likes of Graham Roberts yeah. Peter Nicholas he brought in as well yeah. how crucial was it for that team and how crucial was the team mindset to be positive to get back up to the Absolutely. first division and yeah. with the club like Chelsea being in the second division how crucial was it for the club to get back into the first division? No, listen, it, it was everything. Like, it, let's, let's be honest, it was a disaster, you know, getting relegated because you had, you know, international. So I'm an England international. We had Scottish internationals, you know, Kerry Dixon, England international, mm. Pat Nevin, Steve Clark, you know, going on. You know, we shouldn't be playing in the, cha- in the, in the old, uh, you know, championship. So mm. uh, it was an absolute disaster. But when um, Graham Roberts came uh, and Peter Nicholas, just a bit of, you know, experience and metal, uh, as well it was brilliant you know so we had that that kind of uh, strength uh, there in the center of the park as well and we all we, you know we had the players all around and it just all kind of came together so that was really important uh, certainly Robbo um, <laughs> he soon worked out what Chelsea was like and he fell out with a, a few people as well so it was in division two uh, talk about uh, when you scored you did manage to score your first goal for Chelsea do you remember who it was against Oh, my first goal. I don't know. But what I do know, I was my most prolific in my career was at Chelsea. Yes. Uh, which was good. Who was the first goal? Go on. You, Walsall at home, 2-0. Walsall at home. Right. It's a cracker that I can't remember. 
<laughs> but yeah, I do remember. I saw it at Manchester United and Man City yes. away. Uh, yeah, and, and a few others. Uh, I, remember, I scored a, a free kick against David Seaman, which uh, against QPR at home, which I remember he thought it was going to be a cross, and I nipped it into that near post and caught him off guard. And uh, yeah, I weighed in with a you know a few goals, um, which is great. But if you think you know, we had the likes of you know Gordon Jury. Uh, Kerry Dixon, uh, Kevin McAllister as well, Pat Nevin, you know, some really talented players. And Willow, Kevin Wilson got, couldn't get in the team, you know, on a regular basis. Yeah, he could yeah. score, you know, plenty as well. Yeah. So we had uh, a lot of options there to score plenty of goals. And I think finally with that a bit of confidence, obviously determination to get back into the, in the old first division, uh, we end up scoring a hatful. I think I scored, I think six or seven, which I've never... You scored you know. six goals that season. Wow, there you go. Yeah. Nosebleed, nosebleed time for me. That <laughs> six, that was good. That was good. I'm, I'm assuming you was pleased with this return, bearing in mind the position you played in uh, as a fullback. And just sort of just describe to the listeners for those that maybe are more sort of know you from your time as a commentator. But what sort of type of fullback was you? Was you sort of looking to be a more of a goal scoring fullback, or was you more defensively minded? Uh, no, I think I when I grew up, uh, I was always a winger. So I always played left right. wing and I scored plenty of goals, you know, through youth football, maybe in Australia. Um, but then I got uh, swapped to a fullback on a, on a tour uh, when I was 17 at Aston Villa. So suddenly I had the ability to go forward, but I actually thought, actually, maybe this kid can defend, you know, as well. So what I was, was uh, very comfortable and, and technical on the ball, very, very quick, but suddenly I could defend as well. So, uh, you know, that was kind of a, uh, a more modern fullback. And now what you're seeing, the fullbacks, you know, that's what they are. You know, they're quick, they're good on the ball, they cross and they can, uh, you know, weigh in going forward. Uh, sometimes maybe not quite as defensively uh, solid, but now, you know, going forward is what it's all about. Whereas when I first started, it was more, you know, the big, strong fullback would be solid defensively uh, and maybe not get forward so much. So basically I was a bit of a, a winger's nightmare because wingers hated to defend and I would just run past them all the time and uh, they, you know, kind of wouldn't track back. So uh, yeah, that, that's the sort of thing that I was. So being a winger as well, you know, lots of crosses, I would get in there and uh, and really try and, try and supply people with goals as well. One goal in particular that I would like to mention that you've already mentioned, it was at Main Road, was against Manchester City. Yes. Talk, talk to us about that particular game, Tony, because as you say, it was the top two, I believe, it, at the time in the league. It yeah. was basically the title decider you can see see the highlights on youtube there are sort of you know sort of little bit of clips that here and there but just talk to us about that particular game itself tony yeah because man, man city uh you know they were flying as well that season so we, we us two were the, the class of the you know division that year it was going to come down between us simple as that we were beating everyone else kind of out of sight and uh, the big game and we had to go into their backyard and uh, and kind of take them on and uh, we wore that uh, we had red and white stripy kits. Iconic uh, but I, kit, yes. Yeah, iconic kit, exactly. <laughs> but I remember it just because of that game, because the the noise, honestly, the noise we made that day and, and, and City, you know, they were given up plenty, but our support that day was just incredible. And yeah, we, it was a, a great game of football. You know, a few mistakes here, goals here and there, but uh, from a, a corner kick that we were defending, um, we, on the break, uh, I think I think Kevin Wilson, I think it was, kind of stopped the ball. And it, I was 10 yards inside our own half and I just picked it up and just legged it. And uh, no one basically could catch me. I ran 40, 50, 60 yards. And suddenly there I am in the middle of the goal with a keeper coming out to me. Uh, and I'm a fullback, for God's sake. I go around the keeper and slot it in and, and, and I score. And then everyone goes nuts again. So it was just unbelievable. You know, one of those games, but because of the importance, because it was a way uh, and... Again, you know, the previous season was such a disappointing one that you know, every game we played there, it was always a tough one. Well, suddenly this is the biggest game for a few years and a tough one. And uh, yeah, to score was, was pretty darn special. So uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's one goal I do remember very clearly. Not being biased, would you say that's the best goal of your career? Uh, it is right up there. It is right up there. There is uh, there's one or two for leads that I scored which were pretty special when we won the title. Right. I also would say another one that's really important that I suppose it's easy for other people to gloss over, but not me. It was scored for Chelsea when we beat Middlesbrough in the Zenith Data Systems final at yes. Wembley. And you know what? I know it's only Zenith Data Systems final, you know, not one of the big FA Cups or whatever mm -hmm. it was, mm -hmm. but 
try and tell me that when we're playing in front of 76,500 people at Wembley in a cup final and when Chelsea hadn't won anything for a long time, Middlesbrough had won jack all for even longer and you've got these two hungry sets of supporters. We had, I think, 40,000 Chelsea supporters, you know, inside the stadium uh, and I stick a free kick into the top corner and we win 1-0. Um, and so this is the stuff of dreams and, and you know, that little kid in Adelaide, that's what I was dreaming of. And there the heck I was doing it for Chelsea. So, okay, wasn't my best goal. Goalkeeper probably should have stopped it. Doesn't matter. It was a, a really big one for me. So I, I'd love that goal. I want to talk about that final as well, because I've got the uh, VHS tape and I actually watched it the other day. I actually watched uh. it the other day while I was doing my research. So I want to talk about that later on, Tone. But that season, Chelsea did achieve promotion. How influential was Bobby Campbell in all of that? And in regards to your time at Chelsea, how influential was he? Um, yeah, Bobby was, uh, you know, obviously he was uh, uh, more senior. He was experienced, you know, nothing phased him. Uh, he got Robbo in. You know, to be fair to, to, to Bobby, what he did do was get you know, the right people in, you know, what we needed. And that was, you know, that, that strong leadership with, with Graham Roberts uh, and Nico. So uh, Bobby did well, but really um, you know, he had the players, let's be honest, you know, Kerry Dixon, Jury and all those players I mentioned, uh, you know, should be playing in that sort of league. Um, so he just needed to make sure he fine-tuned it, put the right people in the right places. And uh, once the confidence started, you know, then off we went. But uh, yeah, it was uh, enjoyable and, and he did, uh, you know, everything he needed to do, all the right things. So the first season back in the first division where Chelsea have been ever since, you know, they haven't been uh, down since. We finished fifth that season, which is quite a good achievement. There's not many clubs even now that come up from the second division and then finish as high as that the next. But we also, as you say, won the full members cup beating Middlesbrough in the final. Mentioned you scored the winner. It was a, fabulous free kick <laughs> just I know you've sort of briefly mentioned it before but just take us back to the day sort of from the beginning middle to the end you know what was sort of the mood like in the dressing room beforehand how big of a moment was that for you to not just score but then for it to be the winning goal and just sort of when you sort of look back now what how significant was that day for you uh it was Huge. Uh, it, it really was. And I suppose in the games building up to the final, so as we're playing the, you know, the earlier rounds, mm. uh, the, it, let's be honest, if you're frank, you know, there wasn't a huge amount of interest. You know, you, we didn't have 40,000 pack in the stadium out. They were, uh, you know, 10,000 or whatever it was. Yeah. So uh, we did, we beat whoever it was and we moved on and, and on it went. But as you got closer, you thought, well, actually, you know, we actually might be getting to Wembley here. So, that this is getting a bit more exciting. Then finally, you know, it come around, but uh, it, it wasn't, you know, right at the top of the list until we suddenly, we are in the final now. And then you could sense the excitement around with everyone, you know, as well. And then you realise, oh, wow, I'm actually going to play, you know, in, in a final at Wembley. Um, so it was brilliant. You know, it really was. The frustrating thing, again, uh, was outside, the things that happened outside of the games. Um because we didn't actually include the Zenith Data Systems in our bonus sheet that we signed. And good old Mr. Bates decided not to pay us anything. Uh, no win bonuses along the way. And this is the sort of thing that I, I kind of refer back to as really, really frustrating in that, um, you know, it's just silly. That is just yeah. crazy. You know, we, we, you know, winning a game, whatever it is, you always get a little win bonus it's just the way that it is. We're getting to Wembley now. And uh, yeah, I won't go into detail, but there's so much hoo-ha over that sort of stuff. And, that, and that's the thing that, uh, you know, in my head, I said, this isn't normal. This isn't, you know, what's required. But at the same time, you then try and put all that aside and you think, right, you know, let, let's enjoy this moment as a team. You know, we, we've got here, let's go and, and go and win the darn thing. But uh, suddenly the excitement building up to that. And then when you, you get to Wembley, uh, you think, oh, Jesus, yeah. look how many people are here. Look at what is going on. You start warming up and then it becomes very, very real. And then you think, OK, the nerves are kind of, you know, settling in. Whereas the previous games, you know, you just you got through them, you won and on you went. But, yeah, getting to Wembley is always very, very special. And I was fortunate to play at Wembley, obviously, for my country, England and, uh, you know, and for Chelsea and for them for Leeds and, and others. So it was um, 
always very, very special to play there. But uh, yeah, that was my my first taste of it for Chelsea. And I must admit, it was uh, pretty damn special because the game itself, I'm sure you've watched it back again. I've watched some highlights. Uh, they had their chances, didn't they, Middlesbrough? They, <laughs> they did, they, yes. They played yeah. well. They weren't yeah. bad at all. Uh, so I, I looked back and thought, oh, yeah, Bernie Slaven kind of should have scored and someone else should have scored. But um, it's not who should have scored. It's uh, who does. And, who did, uh, yes. Who did, exactly. And yeah. and I am, as a, as a uh, former Chelsea player, I am proud to say anytime I meet a Middlesbrough uh, fan of about 40, 50-year-old vintage, they come up to me and say, <laughs> You ruined my childhood. That bloody free <laughs> kick, you know, all in all in jest. But you know, it, it's it's ingrained in people's minds because uh, now Chelsea are very used to winning everything and the biggest of things. But back then, you know, both clubs weren't quite like that, and especially Middlesbrough. You know, they hadn't won anything, and something they get their big opportunity uh, and they lose. But for me, that was it's one of my my big games, and I'm sure a lot of people wouldn't think it is, but for me, it was a, it was wonderful. So from that, from winning the full members cup doing well in the league and finishing fifth. Did you think sort of after that, that this would be the springboard for Chelsea to propel to a new level and, you know, perhaps there would be better players coming into the transfer market with all due respect. And then we would be then challenging for the title. Was you sort of feeling that a little bit? And what was the sort of mindset of the, of the team as well? Did the team sort of feel that this was sort of a good level to then kick on? Um, I think you always uh, kind of hope for that. I think we always uh, looked at the other players. I'm not exactly sure what year you know, Andy Townsend and why he came and what have you, but you know, around that time. So, but then oppositely, there was always a downside somewhere. There's always something that happened, you know, somewhere along the way, and and it never kind of stopped. It would go kind of up and down all the time. But uh, you know, on the pitch, you know, I can't uh, say any more than you know, we're always you know solid as a group. Uh, really good players, but I, I always look back at that period and say we could always probably win six or seven on the trot, but depending on what then would happen, we could probably, you know, go on a, a four or five losing streak. It, is, it was just, it was like that. We had the ability to play really, really well. Could we do it over 38 or 42 games, whatever it was, you know, that, that was always going to be a question mark. Uh, and, and that was kind of my overriding feeling in that we were talented. We could beat anyone, you know, on our day and uh, we had some really good players um, but, you know, could we do it consistently uh, for lots of reasons? And, and that was always the, the slight question mark for me. So when you talk about the inconsistency, because it's, for example, 90-91 season, Chelsea finished 11th that yeah. season, despite sort of we reached the, the semi-final of the League Cup. Yeah. League season weren't that great and we finished you know, uh, mid table. So you mentioned about the inconsistencies of, of Chelsea. Do you put it down to players? Do you put it down to perhaps better opposition or from what obviously you've mentioned sort of previously, was there other influences that perhaps made certain decisions that yeah, caused a I bit think, of a stir? Yeah. And listen, Do you think and, and, it was all free or was there my yeah, one and, and, more and you're right. the other? No, you're right. And it's a, it's a combination of that. You know, I don't want to you know, blame everything on, on things elsewhere yes, and around, but I, I, it's, it's just a, it's an attitude. It's more of a case of, um, you know, those things are there which shouldn't be. So it doesn't help. Okay, maybe we could have finished in 10th from the level. You know, it, it, whatever it is, we, we certainly uh, underperformed. And again, we brought some really good players, but it just... Sometimes it happened and sometimes it didn't. Um, we, you just felt that uh, after you said finishing so well in fifth, you can, you know, can we kick on? And we did buy some good players, but we, we didn't. You know, our league, mm. uh, again, was one uh, just you know, of, of a little bit disappointing, uh, unfortunately. Yeah, so uh, it was a, a shame. And that's when, uh, obviously, then Mr. Bates, with, uh, with his contract uh, negotiation skill, uh, really turned me off. And uh, I decided to wait and, and see what happened at the end of the season. Uh, and, you know, and that and finishing 11th didn't suddenly convince me again, because if you finish fifth and say things are building, you're looking really good. And um, you know, you finish sixth or fourth or something. And then the, the great, you think, yeah, you know, absolutely. But once again, I'm thinking, oh, there's just a few more, you know, issues are uh, kind of along the way. Uh, and that's when I thought, okay, uh, let's, uh, let's see what else, uh, you know, is on offer because um, if it was in today's uh, market and the way the club is and what have you, you'd be mad to leave Chelsea. You know what I mean? You wouldn't be looking anywhere else. It's very, very different times. But but then, as I say, it were 
we weren't like that. It was really, you know, some up and down stuff. I want to mention sort of your departure later on, because there are a few questions for me that I'd like to link with that, because there is a little bit of stuff to talk about. But going back to 1990, of course, it was a bit of a busy summer for you in regards to yourself in playing, because it was Italia 90 as well. And as you say, you was part of that England setup. But in regards for Chelsea, they did sign the likes of Dennis Wise and Andy Townsend that summer. What were your thoughts on the club signing these particular players? Yeah, good. Yeah, you're really good. Uh, and Andy uh, and Wise, you know, quality players, absolutely. And when you're when you're looking to to improve and get better, you know, and they paid a good bit of money. You know, I yeah. think it was a Wise like three million quid or something like that. I can't remember, mm. but it was a you know a lot of money and certainly a statement to 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 say, right, you know, here we are and we're going forward. So, uh, yeah, exciting. Again, new signings are always exciting, uh, but those two in particular, uh, and good lads as well, you know, good sort of lads having around the dressing room. So it was uh, uh, exciting times when those two joined, absolutely. Now, as I say, you mentioned, see, there were points where you was going to talk about your departure. So I want to sort of get to that now. Yeah. When did you feel it was the right time to leave Chelsea? And the reason why I asked that particular question to start off with is because did at any point that particular season, as you your contract was coming sort of down a little bit, did Chelsea try to offer you a new contract at this stage? Um, Chelsea offered me a new contract, yes. Uh, they had to do it by a certain date. Uh, legally, so the, the way that it, it worked, and I can't remember. I think it was around March again, whatever, whatever it was. So to make sure they they got uh, a fee and, and everything else, it's all mm. a little bit different now. But uh, I had to go in the end to a tribunal. Uh, so the Bosman thing was kind of kicking in, what have you. But it ended up being a tribunal, and so it was all to do with what your old club contract was being offered to you, what the new club was, and they'd work out a fee, and that that's how you know it was done. Um, but to be fair, they, they came to me, obviously, previous to that. And um, I don't know, it was just uh, when I had that meeting two years previous with Mr. Bates, um, he kind of, you know, sealed it there and then because I just didn't think that's the way to do things. But uh, he knew as well that I would always give 110%. So I would play to right to, to the very end. But And that's what I did. So I didn't really, um, there was no light bulb moment to think, uh, wow, I have got to stay here, you know, because of uh, we're going to win the title or we're going to do this, that and the other. You know, I didn't feel that. I thought uh, certainly with Wise and Andy coming in, I thought, oh, actually, this is this is going to be good. But again, that that was a disappointing season. So um, mm-hmm. uh, and so um, they they wanted to offer me a new one. They didn't. They didn't. They didn't. They waited right to the very end, and they uh, they gave it to me in an envelope. <laughs> right, <laughs> which, which I thought was pretty weird. So I thought, okay, that's uh, that's fine. And I said thanks, but uh, no thanks. And uh, you know, I'm going to wait to the end of the season. Uh, and that's uh, and that's really what happened. But um, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's it. Because sort of li- leading up to that summer of 91, you was in and out of the team at this point under Bobby Campbell. And there was that, one that game... That was why. Yeah, yeah, there was, there was one was game. It was a complete disaster. Losing 7-0. 7-0, yes. away. Yes. Yeah. I would like to talk about that because there's been yeah. a lot of rumours that I've heard from Chelsea fans who I've spoken to about that particular event and obviously yourself. Am I right in saying you played left wing in that game rather than your yeah. customary left, left back position? Yeah. What was your mindset at this point of your Chelsea career? Was it a case where you wanted, was it at that point where you wanted to leave? Was there a case of whatever Bobby Campbell saying, it's not sort of, coming to me in regards to trying to convince me to stay? Was there any issues with... At this well, point yeah, what, what it was, no, with what it was, um, it was a case of uh, I was playing, I wanted to play every single game, you know, simple as that. Uh, I am free to choose. I sign a four-year contract. I then do four years. I'm then free to choose what I'd like to do, you know, after that. That's just, you know, that is my choice. Um, they have the choice of not wanting to sell me before that four years, they made their choice. You know, I can. I think I can then make mine. So when they offered me a new contract, uh, I said uh, thank you, but I'm I'm turning it down. Uh, that's when week next week Bobby Campbell left me out. He says you're not signing a new contract, so you're not playing. 
I said, but, you know, I want to play. I'll keep going right to the end of the season. Obviously, there's no problem. I, have no, I haven't got a problem. He goes, well, no, we're looking at next season, so you're not playing. And so then, you know, he kind of left me out. So I thought, oh, right. So for me, that was actually really a slap in the face, frustrating. So but I understand why, absolutely. Then all of a sudden, this Forest game, he comes back to me. He goes, oh, we now need you to play because uh, we've got this problem and that problem. Uh, but I want you to play, you know, kind of left wing. Uh, I said, well, I'll play wherever you want me to play and I'll play. No problems at all. And so uh, that's the story of, uh, of that. So I played there. But clearly, just the way that I thought that he handled everything was not good. And so the mindset was never going to be absolutely 100 percent. And uh, we went out there and we struggled. You know, we struggled badly. And unfortunately, was it, um, uh, was it Frank that played left back? I think it was it Frank Sinclair. Frank Sinclair. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Frank, Frank Sinclair. And I think Crosby, the right winger, kind of. Uh, yeah, you know, tore him apart a little bit and uh, I didn't really help too much uh, with him either. So it was, uh, yeah, one of those games where everything kind of went wrong. But it, it was, uh, that was also a culmination of lots of things that suddenly, you know, just became apparent in that game. And uh, that's when I, when I talked to you about, um, you know, consistent high level performance, mm-hmm. you know, and spirit. Suddenly when, when it goes wrong, you get those sort of performances when you know something isn't, you know, 100% right. So, um, yeah, but that was that was hugely disappointing, that game. But, yeah, I was ready to play. And uh, for that one, he, he kind of brought me back from the wilderness because because uh, he needed needed me to play. Lastly, on that particular game, because it is, it is a bit of a crazy scoreline, even now, you know, even looking back to sort of 1991. But w- when you was on the pitch, when you was on left wing and things, as you say, weren't going well, did you see in other people's performances that perhaps they weren't giving it their all? Because, you know, there's been times where, say, you know, the term down tools has sort of come into mm. effect. Did you see at that point, and this is probably one of the reasons why, as you say, the inconsistency kicks in. Did you see a lot of that with players' mindsets and in, yeah, in I, the I think- performance? Yeah, I, th- I think, uh, listen, I'm, I'm part of that as well. You know, did, did I... Uh, did I go out there and give 100%? Yes, I did. But was it like 100%, you know, when I'm absolutely flying and what have you? And, uh, and probably not. And, you know, a lot of the players were like that. But then when things start to go wrong, uh, that's when I talk about, you know, really strong groups. And then you talk about groups that are, that are fractured and, and things aren't, you know, quite 100, 100%. Uh, and then you end up with something like that. Uh, obviously, I was played out of position. There's, there's others in the team. Uh, that you know that weren't doing well or whatever it may be and suddenly you get that sort of performance and that's when it was you know extremely frustrating you think well how how the hell have we got to this point when you know the players that we had you know should never have been like that so uh disappointing for lots of reasons but I think to to suddenly get exposed like that was yeah it, it was uh it was a shocker yeah one of those games where um you're not you're certainly not proud of uh you know the performance uh and we got what we deserved which was absolutely nothing we got absolutely tanked but you know that lots of things uh, go into into uh you know that sort of performance and uh, i say just my situation it was is a one instance of that that could have been multiplied by a few few boys in that team a couple of months later the summer of 91 you did end up leaving chelsea for leeds united i believe the fee was around 1.3 million pounds how did this move materialise and when did sort of the light bulb really come on to, to the point where you wanted to leave Chelsea? Uh, well, I think through the course of that second half of the, you know, the last season, um, obviously when I asked for a transfer like two seasons previous, um, and that's when you know, the, the reasons for leaving were, were, were there and they hadn't hugely changed you know, towards the end. Obviously we had to right. read ups and downs. So I didn't, I said I didn't, to suddenly change my mind. It's just thought, I thought, right, you know, let's do my best for the next uh, couple of years and then uh, assess my options, basically. See, but see it was always to... in the back of your mind, though, that you was looking yeah. at the next step in your, yeah, exactly. in your football yeah. career. Yeah, absolutely. And I didn't rule it out staying, you know, absolutely not. Because mm-hmm. um, if suddenly things, uh, you know, turned around, things were sorted out, things were on an even keel mm-hmm. and we're all going the same direction, I'd, absolutely. Of course I would have stayed. It, it, you know, you'd be crazy not to, but it wasn't, that wasn't the case. And I thought, okay, Let's get through the end of the season. Uh, then, of course, when Bobby kind of left me out and left me out, I think, well, this is silly. So that didn't help matters. Um, and then I just waited at the end to see uh, what was going to happen, basically. Uh, I was off, I think, to in- uh, with England, yeah, on an England trip to in Australia and New Zealand. So I was on, on tour with the, uh, the national team. And I thought, right, there was two or three other clubs interested as well. 
Um, but Leeds United got in touch uh, before I went. And I said, no, I'm going to talk to, you know, whoever it is uh, when I get back. And they said, no, you're not. You get your, your backside up here now. We want to talk to you straight away. So they made it abundantly clear that, uh, you know, they really, really wanted me to, uh, to talk to them uh, and, and sign. So, you know, as a player, kind of that's, you know, what you want. Uh, right. And they finished, I think, fourth in that season that we finished. Chelsea finished 11th. We finished 11th then. They finished fourth. Um, and just talking uh, to Howard Wilkinson, um, you know, convinced me that, okay, uh, let's, let's uh, give this a go. This seems uh, uh, the right option at this time. Uh, clearly the rivalry between the two sides is, is, is rather <laughs> intense. And obviously I signed for the wrong club, uh, which was, <laughs> it was really funny. I've, I've got to say that the, the Chelsea fans are, uh, uh, are funny. I mean, we, I came back that first season with Leeds and uh, even when I, I ran out the tunnel, uh, I got booed kind of straight away. And, and listen, and I understand why. And I take that as a compliment. I really do. Because, uh, you know, if, if they didn't care, they wouldn't, it wouldn't really matter. But because mm. clearly they did. And, you know, I'd left. And I'd, obviously then I had gone to that, that club, that particular club as well. Uh, so I got booed straight away, which, you know, was absolutely fine. And then in the warm up, uh, Leeds, we did a, a keep ball session. So there's just 10 players and we just keep, you know, passing the ball uh, to each other. And, Every time I got the ball, <laughs> the Chelsea fans are Ooh, like going absolutely crazy. So my Leeds teammate, teammates thought it would be hysterical just to keep giving me the ball. So every <laughs> second pass now was to me. And the Leeds lot, I think, got tired. Sorry, the Chelsea fans got tired just booing me all the time. In the end, I thought, right, I'm going down to stretch my groins or something. Just get away from me. Keep the ball away. You know, it was crazy. But it was uh, obviously all in, all in good humour. But um, uh, yeah, I, I don't take that personally in that. Um, you know, I, I know they weren't happy and I understand why, uh, but, you know, hopefully I, I did well while I was there and uh, they, they certainly saw that. So I was going to say, you, you come out of the tunnel going on to Stamford Bridge pitch for the first time as a Leeds United player. You hear the boos, obviously there probably would be a few expletives as well. <laughs> what, what what was going through your mindset at that, uh, at that stage? You know, because you hear nowadays, you know, f- footballers, with especially with online abuse, but obviously the abuse that some players do get from the stadiums, did it really affect you at any stage, or was it, as you say, just in the back of your mind because you're there to play football? Yeah, no, it, it's honestly, it it, uh, it it didn't affect me at all. Uh, um, I, I think it more affected me in the warm up, which I say sounds weird, but only because you don't expect it in a warm up. Mm, yeah. Uh, yeah, everything is quiet. Mm. We're just, we're just kicking the ball around and suddenly they're going crazy. I thought, wow, this is weird. Uh, of course, every time in the game, they, they would boo as well. But, you know, that happens anyway. So once you're in the zone, you get in that area, uh, you're a professional, you walk over that white line uh, and now it's, it's man on man. It's me against my opposite number from the Chelsea team. It's not me against, you know, the, the crowd type of thing. Yeah. So I never, I just like, a, a, you know, the, the more hostile atmosphere. I think it's brilliant. I, I love that. I think it's great, whether it's for you or against you or whatever it is. So I, I didn't, it didn't affect me. Uh, when I was playing, but um, it was just a, a surprise when I first, first walked out. And uh, uh, it was all, as I say, it, it, of course it was, it was um, uh, loud and what have you, but, you know, again, I understand why. Uh, uh, and so it's absolutely fine. It, it's part of the game. Uh, and on we went and, uh, you know, we had a, we had a great game. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, I think, uh, I think Leeds actually won that one. He won that one two one, but um, I could at least uh, you know go out there. It wasn't a five nil hiding or anything. So uh, yeah, but again, you that's know true. Chelsea. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that, that's a bit. That would be a bit different. Yeah, then I would get dogs abuse again. But uh, uh, and, and you know what? The rivalry is great because you know the, the Leeds Chelsea rivalry goes back you know so very far as well. Yeah, and uh, for for many a year, um, my my two boys. I've got two two sons and a daughter. And my eldest son is a is a, a big Chelsea fan. He's a mad Chelsea fan, and uh, you know he, he loves uh, Chelsea uh, through thick and thin. And uh, my second son more so remembers Leeds, so he's a Leeds fan. And so for years and years, you know the brotherly love there. Normally it's a bit of a competition. Well, it wasn't because Leeds were rubbish for you know God knows sixteen years. <laughs> it was no fun, you know. My eldest one going, oh, this is this is no good. So finally, Leeds coming back. You know, at least it brought back some of those nice memories and. Uh, you know, Chelsea, I'm, I'm sure, love nothing more than beating Leeds and, and vice versa. Leeds love beating Chelsea. So, But that rivalry is, you know, the way it should be. It, it's good now. So that was your sort of Chelsea career that we've sort of gone through. I want to talk about the current events now. 
Um, one in particular that has divided a lot of opinion. And I also wanted to sort of get your thoughts on this based on, you know, you commentating Serie A football, which does have this type of software as well. VAR. So, Tony, what's, what's, what's your thoughts on VAR? Obviously, do you feel it, it, it's a good thing for football? Do you feel it can be tweaked a little bit? What's your overriding views on VAR? Uh, is this podcast in four different parts? Because I could be going on for a long time about <laughs> bloody VAR. And it drives me mad. Yes, I, I am. You're right. I, I commentate. So that's what I, I do now. I'm also uh, an ambassador for the for the for Legion United, uh, the club. But I do a lot of commentating. So I commentated on uh, City R for God knows how many years. Uh, mm. I do internationals. I've done the Euros. I did eight nine games there. Uh, I do, um, you know, lots and lots of other stuff. So any championships. So I've seen from the start of VAR right up to, to what it is now. Uh, what I will say is that right at the start, uh, I was certainly for it. Uh, I thought getting the obvious decisions corrected uh, can only be a good thing. What a mess we made of it <laughs> in that. It is so important that the game flows. It's quickly and we get to those right decisions. Um, you know, when you're talking the inch of a, you know, a nat splitty leg width or something, it's just ridiculous. You know, that's not what you know, I don't think VR should be brought in for. If you want that, go and watch American football because that stops and starts. It'll be minute detail and on you go. So I thought we got the balance quite wrong. Uh, I think the Bundesliga, and I covered that a little bit, uh, I thought they got it right, very well, right from the start. I thought they, the way they handled it were, was excellent. Uh, and they really gave the referee at the ground the control. And, you know, if he was sure he saw something, that's fine, get on with it. Only when it was something he didn't, he would run across and then he would decide. So that was good. Uh, Syria, when they started, disaster. Oh, God, my first game of Serie A, I just could not believe what I was watching. It took six minutes, like six whole minutes for this penalty decision to uh, be given. And it was clear as day that it was a yard inside the box, but no one kind of knew what was going on. Uh, you know, the referee is standing there with his, his finger in his ear talking to someone, then walks over and looks at the thing. So, you know, it's been a learning curve. I think that's what I'd, I'd probably come out of. It. It's been a learning curve. Now, the Italians have suddenly got a different interpretation of like the hand, uh, handball rule in the penalty box. So they're giving penalties for fun. So they're going to VAR. It clips his little finger and it's a penalty. I'm thinking, oh, my God. You know, so the, the, I suppose the offence needs to equal a penalty, you know, a goal. And when it clips a little finger from it, so it got really silly. So to be fair to the Italians, they got a little bit better. But now I think the way the Premier League have done it, I think we've gone a bit wacky as well. You know, we haven't got to grips with it correctly. I think we are now looking at these, these lines, and the thickness of the line and all this sort of stuff. It's just got very, very silly. And suddenly we are looking at a lot of instances and decisions, which I think other countries who have used it better aren't doing that. So I'm hoping now, and I've just read the latest laws because I need to be up on all of these laws. And they, and they keep saying now that, that yeah, it's going to change again. And this is what's going to happen. I'm thinking, oh, here we go again. But what I would say, I think VAR uh, as a concept, I think is a good one. It's how it's used and interpreted. Uh, I think we're doing a bad job of that. But the Euros and Euro 2020, uh, I thought the refereeing and, and that was, was pretty good. Yes, there were one or two decisions which I wouldn't agree with, uh, even with VAR, but I thought on the whole, I thought the balance was pretty darn good. And if we could replicate that, I'll be happy, but we haven't done that last season. We were, you know, the, the way it was used, what well, wasn't very good. Last thing on, on VAR, and you, make, you did actually make a good point. You mentioned about comparing it with the Bundesliga and the referee having control. So whereby, yes, he's got VAR as a backup, so, you know, so to speak. So he's got like another... Mm camera to see and everything yeah. else. Do you feel that with that then that the Premier League referees they use it as maybe a scapegoat because they're maybe a perhaps frightened to make the yeah. decision? Absolutely. So in, it ends up, you know, they're not making the decision. Uh, they're always waiting to see what they've done wrong. And of course when they get that call in their ear, uh, they're <laughs> then they're suddenly they're gonna decide, well obviously I've got to go have a look and obviously I've got to give it the other way. Um, but you know, when you've got VAR, you know, looking at millimetres and, and timing and, and slowing it down to, you know, whatever, uh, you know, part of the film, uh, second, millisecond, I think that's just crazy. You know, I, 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 the whole concept of VAR was to get the, the, the obvious, clear and obvious errors changed. 
And when it's not clear and obvious, and I know that is suddenly a gray area, I understand that by just by saying that it's a gray area. But, you know, let's get the real obvious ones. You know, when he's a foot offside or two foot, that's that. Yeah, that's offside. But when you're talking millimeters and what have you, there's some crazy ones. Uh, you know, we've all seen on match of the day, you know, when suddenly it's the armpit. So there's a line from the armpit down to this. I'm thinking, oh, come on. It's just, you know, are we using it really for that sort of thing? And uh, yeah, I know technology will move on and then we'll, we'll be able to define that exactly right. But I think stopping the game is against what, you know, football is all about, you know, that many times. You could be keep stopping the game forever, couldn't you? So clear and obvious. Let's do that. Let the referee get on with it and make his decision and feel like he's in charge at least. Not going to discuss VAR too much now because, as you say, it's probably going to be another few hours <laughs> just sort of going through certain decisions and everything else. But I want to talk about Chelsea of the present day, Chelsea of today, yeah. European champions for the second time. It's quite weird actually saying it for the second European champions for the second time. Sounds good. It's, it sounds great. <laughs> it, still, it still sounds a little bit different, but... What have you made of Chelsea sort of over the last 12 months? It's been obviously a lot different from what Chelsea was this time last year with under Frank, now with Thomas Tuchel in charge and the way Chelsea have set up with Werner now sort of not as the main striker was probably what he was potentially going to be when he first came in and with mm-hmm. Havertz now. What's your, what's your overall view on Chelsea Football Club today? I, I think... I, um... Again, and I've seen them uh, obviously on TV a load, but in the flesh a few times now as well. When they when they played uh, Leeds at Stamford Bridge, I thought, uh, God, Chelsea were were were, were superb uh, for like forty five minutes an hour. There, they were just different class, you know, absolutely. And the the speed, the way they moved the ball around, um, I love it when you've got you know good youngsters coming through. It's obviously Mason Mount, you know, how he's developed has, has been uh, wonderful. I don't know how important that is for you know for Chelsea. Uh, supporters in any football club wants you know at least a, a local uh, lad in there that does well that gets his opportunity but as we all know at Chelsea that's almost impossible isn't it you know because of the talent that they've got so to you have to go out on loan prove yourself and then come back and do the business so suddenly uh, certainly Frank Lampard was uh, fortunate in one way because that's what he had to do you know he was forced into that however uh, suddenly you, you develop these players like you know Abraham James Mount at Tamori, et cetera, et cetera, that, that, that did get their opportunity and, and they look great. Then you add to the, the experience that they, they've got and then you suddenly buy Havertz, Werner, Thiago Silva, and then obviously the, the keeper as well, Mendy. Uh, and you think, wow, you know, now they've got an absolute chance. But um, certainly Werner uh, is one of those players that I keep thinking is going to, you know, he's going to smash 40 goals one season. But actually, uh, it would be a lot better if the, if the weight was taken off him as you said, whether he plays out wide or before, and then he will turn it on and he'll probably then go and score 15, 20 goals and set up 15 or 20. I think he'll be a great asset, but that balance, and that's what it's always been about, hasn't it? And then when you suddenly, you know, Lampard left, Tuchel comes in and he got the balance. You know, he managed to work it out, what was required. And then you go on that, you know, winning run unbeaten for God knows how many games. And and you, the, the team looks so different. You think, well, how's that possible? But it's just by getting that balance right. And of course, you know, Havertz, um, I suppose, obviously with the German manager as well, just understanding that a bit more. But take, players take time to settle as well. And he's only a young lad. Uh, you know, that's what kind of people forget as well. Yes, I know the money's huge, but they still need time to to settle. But once you then have Thiago Silva, is any more experience than him? No. Put all the other good players together, a bit of confidence, and uh, away they go. And yeah, they, they looked, you know, really, really good at times. And the only thing uh, was missing, a lot of the games that I saw, was just the finish, you know, just that finishing because uh, Chelsea really could have won so many games uh, quite easily, yet because they didn't score, they then got punished. And so it was never a case of not making the chances. It was just that last little bit. So you can understand why now, can't you, that uh, the number one priority is getting that uh, that number nine that can just finish off all the good work. And uh, hence why I'm sure it looks like a lot of money is going to be spent pretty shortly, or, or so it seems anyway. Let's see. Well, I was going to say, as of sort of recording, Chelsea have heavily linked with a former player of theirs in Romelu Lukaku. He scored a lot of good goals for Inter Milan, fired Inter Milan. He was part of that side that won the Serie A, finally sort of taking it from Juventus after so many years of winning it. But do you think 
Lukaku's the answer. Do you believe that he would be the right fit, or do you think that there's somebody else out there based on what Chelsea how how they play? Do you think that there is someone out there that would suit that better, or do you think Lukaku is the answer? Uh, I, I think there's I think there's two or three answers out there. Uh, I think they all cost a lot of money. Um, but when you're talking about you know what is the answer for Chelsea, well, what's well, clearly what's required is just a goal scorer. You know, it's someone to finish off the work, and that's it. You know, you, you're not talking about too much too much else. Yes, they need to link play. You know, absolutely, they need to link up with those because you'll have runners from midfield that and they can score. Vern obviously will feed off that. Habits will feed off that. But that that person that will guarantee twenty goals. You know, in that season, that's what Chelsea are after now. With that player, you're suddenly, you know, you, you're on your fingers of one hand, aren't you? Because Chelsea are champions of Europe, for goodness sake. So we're talking the elite, uh, and that's what they're going for. And all the names have been mentioned, you know, Lewandowski, Haaland, mm-hmm. uh, Harry Kane, uh, Lukaku. Yeah, yes, 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 yes. It's, it's that level. They're all great players, all great goal scorers. And Lukaku, the model that you saw at Chelsea... The Lukaku now is a is a different player, like a different player. You know, he has come on absolutely leaps and bounds, and he has got strength. He has got now that that finishing touch. He has got the ability to hold it up and bring others into play. Uh, you know, there's so much more to his game now, and I, I think he's progressed and progressed. You saw it was at West Brom, then at Everton, then at Manchester United. Maybe not so much, but at Inter, uh, he's been superb. Some games unplayable just with his strength and ability, uh, but always looking for ball to feet. He spins and scores. And uh, yeah, he's an impressive, impressive individual now. A uh, great experience. I think he knows all about Chelsea. And I think if you're talking someone as, a, as a, an, an easier fit, he knows what he's coming into. And I think uh, he would be you know, a heck of a signing. He's going to cost a lot of money. Uh, but all the other ones that I talked about are going to cost a lot of money as well. So that's the in the market. That's what, uh, you know, that money gets you a, a top quality 20 goal striker. And that's is exactly what Chelsea need. Final question, Tony, for this interview. And again, thank you very much for your time. How do you reflect back on your career at Chelsea? Uh, a lot of fondness. I really do. And uh, it, it, it's easy to say that. And I'm not saying that just because I'm on you know a Chelsea podcast. And I would say that about a lot of clubs because uh, I enjoy I enjoyed love playing football. I love doing it well. I, I try to do my best. Uh, supporters, uh, you know, are, are right behind you. And, and it's brilliant. And when you've got the support that I had at Chelsea, it is fantastic. You know, we won things. We had, I've got great memories, say, you know, at Wembley, you know, winning the, the title, uh, the the, uh, the old second division title as well. Um, it, but uh, there's some frustration in there as well. But I, I don't look back and have regrets. I, I'm delighted I joined. I, I had a great uh, four years uh, down there, and uh, yeah, you know it, it's a uh, it's a proud moment to have those four years playing in blue, absolutely, and uh, never never regret any of it. So um, you know, I always look out for their results as well. And um, you know, when they won uh, Europe, I was jumping up and down with you know with everyone else, and uh, uh, and rightly so. So yeah, uh, long may that continue. There's a rivalry, obviously, when it, when it comes to playing with, against Leeds. Uh, I'm always a bit split on that one. Uh, that's a difficult <laughs> one, but. Uh, I spent six years at Leeds, but for my four years at Chelsea, I always do look back, you know, very, very fondly uh, on them. Absolutely. Well, Tony, thank you very much for your time being on the podcast. I've appreciated it. And hopefully once the season sort of kicks off properly and we get full attendance, hopefully we'll see you down the bridge one day as well. Absolutely. I I would love to come down there. Uh, I will be down there, obviously, with with Leeds as well and uh, watching what is now uh, wonderful football. Uh, Chelsea plays some some great stuff and long may that continue. Hopefully this time it's a real uh, title tilt. That's what uh, that's what the, uh, the boys deserve. Superb. Tony, thank you very much for your time today. Cheers, Keith. Lovely. Thanks very much. is part of the Sports Social Podcast Network.